Dobre den, Radio. Um, thank you so much for being here, for joining us all for an awesome day of lots of science and discovery. I'm a physicist and innovator, which means that I do multiple types of roles in my job. I specialize in high energy density plasma physics. But I'm also really interested in applying this for new technology and designing new solutions that can make a real impact on our world. As part of my role, I use tools to do that, and the tool of choice that I have is extreme lasers, which means as part of my role, I get to press fire on the most powerful laser in the world. This is one of our Gemini lasers <laughs> at the lab at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire. There'll be a siren and then the laser will come. So that's just one single pulse that is fired from our Gemini laser. And it was aimed at that unfortunate piece of paper. Now the size of that laser burn is about 10 centimeters. So that's quite large, actually. But what you saw here and what you heard was the impact of light. So the energy in lasers is exactly the type of energy that's surrounding all of us right now. It's the reason that I can see you and you can see me is because there is light energy bouncing around and entering into our eyes. That light energy is also in lasers, but we've engineered that light into a form that carries the energy in a very orderly way so that the light can become concentrated. And when you do that, it means that you can focus energy in a very short period of time and focus it onto a specific area. In this case, that laser was able to rapidly heat the surface of the material. The surface of the material got really hot very quickly, and it heated the air just above the surface of the paper, so that it expanded really quickly. And when air expands really quickly, it sends what we call a shock wave, or a shock wave moving through air and detected by our ears is sound. So the sound that you heard, the very loud clap from the laser hitting the paper was just a change of energy from light energy into heat energy into particle energy in the shock waves that ended up in our ears. Now, the laser I showed you, the part of the laser I showed you right here, is an earlier part in the laser chain. So I would say that this is actually a very low power laser. Because there's one other thing that we can do with lasers. We can focus them in time, which means we can deliver that laser very quickly, but we can also focus it in space. This is, of course, light, and light can be focused by lenses down to very small points. So the last thing that we do with our lasers in the chain when we do experiments is to take that light, which at one point would be about 10 centimeters wide, that disk of light is focused down to about five millionths of a meter, that's five microns. Each strand of hair is roughly about 100 millionths of a meter. So we're focusing this light to an extremely tiny spot. And when you do that, that's how you get to extreme intensities of light. Now, the intensity of light captured in the photograph that you're looking at here, this is a photograph of a real experiment where we focus the laser down. It comes from the right-hand side of the screen and focuses down onto a solid target and generates this burst of energy. The laser coming in, the intensity of that light is a thousand billion, billion times more intense than the sunlight that you feel here on Earth. Or it's equivalent of taking all of the sunlight that's falling down on the Earth right now. And if you had a Earth-sized lens, if you could take all of that light and focus it down onto the top of a pinhead, all of that light in that one second would be equivalent to the light intensity when we press fire on these extreme lasers. I'm an experimentalist, so when someone tells me 
you've got a really powerful laser and we're going to throw loads of energy and, and laser energy onto these targets in one go, I can't help but think, what happens next? What are you going to do? Show me the evidence of what happens when you press fire on these lasers and you focus them on unbeknownst targets. But before I go on to explain what does happen in terms of the physics, I have to quantify what I mean when I say the most powerful laser in the world. And I'll qualify it for you here. Because it's all very well and good, me saying the most powerful is a very nice emotive form, but we're all scientists and engineers in the room, so we need some numbers behind this. So if you think what power means, when we talk about power, we are measuring how fast you deliver energy in a certain amount of time. So the equation is energy divided by time, how fast you deliver that energy. An average light bulb delivers about 100 watts. So that's our first point on the scale. Now, I had a look last week to, to, to look about how much electrical power, the electricity power that's being delivered across the whole of Bulgaria right now the peak amount of power across the whole country is about 4 billion watts. So we've gone quite up the scale now. In one single pulse, when we press fire, we deliver one quadrillion watts. One quadrillion is 1,000 trillion, which means it's one million billion. It's a huge number. 10 with 15 zeros after it. That's what we call a petawatt. Peta is times 10 to the 15. So one petawatt of power. That's what we're delivering instantaneously. Tens of thousands of times more power than the whole of Bulgaria is using right now. When we do that, we capture these bright flashes of energy, of light emission. This is what's captured on a regular SLR camera, a digital camera. What the camera that we've used here is seeing is the visible light. Unfortunately, that's where the limitation of the camera ends. It can only see visible light. But that's the job of us physicists, is to quantify and qualify what else is coming out. Because we can also put diagnostics and cameras around that central point and say, what other types of energy is coming from this very uh, central, focused point of energy? Now, when I normally talk about petawatt lasers and I talk about energy forms coming from these central points, people often say, oh, that sounds kind of like the Death Star. Um, you know, what kind of dangerous laser is this? And in a way, these lasers are dangerous. They're certainly not on the scale of destroying planets like the Death Star, but they destroy tiny little targets. Millimeters of, of metal are instantaneously vaporized by these lasers. The actually only useful part of this GIF is actually the focusing parabolic lens that you see on the side of the Death Star. That focusing curved etched into the side of the, of the, of the sphere. That's exactly what we use in our experiments. That's the shape of the mirrors. The laser comes off that curved mirror and is focused down to a central point. So that central focusing point, that's where we place our targets. For example, target. Now, these, the, the end of the spokes is a tiny piece of metal, and um, it's only about a millimeter in size. It's really quite tiny, um, so it's only a tiny piece of foil. But when, you f when we do press fire, that light is captured onto that target, and it rapidly heats it. Now, the pulse width, or the duration of that laser pulse, is half a trillionth of a second a very, very small period in time. So we take some energy, we put it in form of laser light, electromagnetic energy, and we thrust it at this target in half a trillionth of a second. When we place our diagnostics around that area, we actually measure emission of particles and X-rays. The X-ray spectrum can tell us about the temperature of the tiny target that was obliterated by the laser. And when we do measure that, we are measuring central points that are tens of millions of degrees Celsius. 
So this laser is heating that spot to tens of millions of degrees Celsius in half a trillionth of a second. The center of the sun is roughly 10 million degrees. So in, in my lab, in the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, every single time we press fire, we are creating a tiny little micro dot of material that is hotter than the center of the sun. Now, when I first heard about that, discovered that, about 10 and a half years ago, after I'd finished my first degree at university, there was a laboratory just down the road from Oxford where they were doing these very experiments, and I had no idea. I was 21 by the time I'd figured I'd realized this for the first time, and I couldn't believe, I thought it's the most incredible thing ever, these beautiful, extreme structures of physics hotter than the center of the sun, and I was only 15 miles away. I was hooked, and that has, I've been there working ever since for that very reason. So if you're just here for some extreme physics, there you go, you're right there, you're looking at something that's hotter than the center of the sun. But for me, I need something a bit more than that. I want to be able to use that physics to make a difference to the world. I want to use that technology and apply it for something that could make our future or our lives just a little bit better. But back to the physics before I get to the, the fun stuff at the end. To explain what you're looking at, it's not just regular matter that you saw on that last photo. It's actually the fourth state of matter. It's what we call plasma. Now, plasma is just the fourth way that atoms and particles can be arranged. So this is a kind of rough description of matter, solids, liquids, and gases that we're quite regularly uh, used to. And they have an atomic structure, which means you have a positive center surrounded by a cloud of negative particles called electrons. So in the center, you have the nucleus that has protons and neutrons. So it's overall, it's positive where the cloud surrounding it in an atom is neutralizing that positive charge. So you have equal charge of electrons to the charge of the protons. And that's how the solids, liquids, and gases are, right? That's what we learn about in school. Well, there's actually a fourth way. You think a little bit outside the box. And this is where you start to enter the territory of kind of research and scientific thinking. Think, think a little bit more creatively about how these particles could be arranged. Because when you do, that's when you enter the realm of plasma. A plasma is those same particles, but not in the atomic structure. It's a way of pulling the atomic structure apart, or popping it open, or exploding the atom, so that you've got the same number of positive particles and negative particles. So overall, that cloud of stuff is still neutral, but if you look at little individual local zones, you'll have a little bit more negative charge, and then you might, over here, you might have a little bit more positive charge. So this whole entity becomes a cloud of charged particles all interacting with each other via Maxwell's equations and electromagnetism. That is your plasma. And now that's job one of the laser. The laser itself is a form of electromagnetic energy, so light, is formed of electric waves and magnetic waves propagating from point A to point B. And in the most extreme lasers in the world, the electric field is so strong, it's so dominant, that it's able to pull those electrons from the positive nuclei. In an atom, the electrons are kept swimming and swirling around the center by a Coulomb attraction, an attraction between positive and negative. But when these lasers come along, these oscillating waves of energy, they grab hold of those electrons, rip them off, and then start vibrating them very, very rapidly. So that is one part of the laser. It's so extreme that it can rip apart atoms. But the next job, this comes into a special class of laser, which we call ultra-relativistic lasers. And that's because the electric and magnetic fields of the lasers are so high that they give a little pushing force to the electrons. And they push them so rapidly, so quickly, that they get to almost the speed of light. 
So they start becoming traveling relativistically, where strange things happen for mass and energy. That is a description of the Lorenz force. The Lorenz force is a description that's come about from electromagnetism that tells you that charged particles with a charge E, if they're in the vicinity of an electric field, capital E, then a force will be experienced. And now, in regular kind of physics that we're used to, normally the, the magnetic fields are pretty measly to compare to the electric fields. So the Lorentz force is normally little e times big E. But in our extreme relativistic laser plasma world, now you're having to incorporate the fact that the magnetic field is affecting the velocity v of the electron. So now the full Lorentz force is in, is in force from the laser itself. And what that really does in kind of a, a macro world description is to push the electrons. So that's one force from the laser. There's another one that comes along when you enter extreme laser world. And that's what we call the ponderomotive force. Now, I like this description of a force. There's, there's a whole bunch of mathematics there, if that's your thing. Um, I'm an experimentalist. I'm much more about observation and what things mean in the real world. What this force is telling you is that because there's a gradient in the electric field, there be a force. There's a gradient in lasers in real life because the laser spots that we see, far from being just round blobs that are uniform, they actually have a Gaussian distribution, which means that they're really, really strong in the middle, and then it drops off as you reach the outer edges of that laser spot. That means that there's a gradient, a change in electric field that's a function of space. And so that ponderomotive force starts to kick in. Now, the job of that uh, force is to give another kick to those electrons. So laser comes in. It comes in from the top right, hits onto the target, and then you get an emission of energy in that same direction because the lasers come in and thrust those particles forward. This is a couple of simulation codes now. This is kind of our kind of simulation gaming um, programs that we use for laser plasmas, where the laser comes in from the left-hand side and shoots through some material. The one on the left-hand side that's wiggling right now, that's what happens when a laser goes through a gas. It comes in and pushes the electrons, the blue bits, out the way. So they get a push, and you end up with this bubble structure where the black bit in the middle, where there's, there's no electrons, and a configuration of electrons around that laser pulse. On the right-hand side, you have what happens when you shoot a solid metal. This time, the laser hits onto the surface, propels electrons forward, and the electrons are the kind of red, ready bits, and they go shooting forward in a cone-like mechanism through that metal. So if you take nothing else away from this talk today, remember that these extreme lasers can propel particles to almost the speed of light. Now, the reason why that's really incredible for, for me as a physicist to even know that we can do this experimentally, we can see this with our own eyes, is because the conventional, the standard way of accelerating particles to the speed of light is to use this machine, an accelerator, a radio frequency cavity that has an electric field inside it. So that electric field pushes and pulls particles till they reach very high speeds. And it has magnetic fields which steer the beam so they can go around in a circle, essentially. And so for many decades, we've used this equipment and it's very, very good. It's really good at producing precise, accelerated particles to energies, whatever you want. Really, really fast, very slow, anything in between. It's very reliable technology that has been working for many, many years. But you can see the size of it. I mean, these things are probably sit about um, five, five foot five, six foot high off the ground. They're an, at least a meter long. And we've just come along and said that if you shoot a laser onto a tiny little piece of material, 
you can also accelerate particles. The particle accelerator you're looking at here is a new age of accelerator technology driven by lasers. I've started to talk about it like the quantum age of accelerators, where we're actually using light as the particle pusher. And so what you're looking at here is a highly miniaturized version of an accelerator, a supercharged, micro-sized particle accelerator. And now, as a physicist, as I said, very interesting, very cool, like, wow, great. As an innovator, I suddenly go, wait, wait a minute. If you can make things something really small and supercharged, then there must be lots of opportunities opening up. And that's because miniaturization is generally good for technology. This has happened a lot in computing over the last few decades. This is an IBM 5 megabyte hard drive from 1956. This is when computing was really starting to kick off, and people were really using computing to calculate things very rapidly, to calculate trajectories to, to the moon, to do very complicated uh, code cracking. But back in those days, five megabytes was, was pretty you know, top of the range. But you can see that's four people it takes to load that back on a truck. Five megabytes now is probably the size of that image file that I have loaded onto this single slide. So we're now living in a world where we're all carrying multi-core processors that carry thousands and thousands of these photographs just in our pocket. And that's because lots of inquisitive and creative minds have come together to miniaturize and supercharge that technology so that we can use it for more than just science and mathematics. We can actually use it for our daily lives. And that kind of idea what is what really motivates me in physics. How can we make things better in order to apply them for something that could make a difference to our lives? That, to me, is the research and innovation cycle. So research is about finding things out, about asking questions that have never been asked before. That's one binder of myself and all of the other speakers that you'll see today, all of the other experts in the room. We all ask questions for a living. How does something happen? Why does something happen? What happens if I do this? What if I happens if I apply it for that? That's what our job is. We are experts in asking questions, and we're experts in answering them. That's what we've been training our whole lives for, is how to answer these questions using critical thinking and applying creative approaches. Now, I'm starting to enter a realm where I'm not just answering questions and finding answers. I'm saying, well, how can I apply that to make something better? And so that's where you come into the role of innovation. Innovation is about applying ideas and new approaches to improve a process or a product or just to make something better. And I'm sat in the middle of this cycle at the moment. It's a really great place to be in my job, um, the fact that I get to interact with um, experts in plasma physics and technology and accelerator science, but I'm now talking to people who might be able to use this technology to improve their um, role or improve their job. It's a really great place to be. And one of the first areas of innovation that I'm going to introduce you to is in X-ray technology. So X-rays um, is, is something a lot of you, a lot of people feel very familiar with. It's the technology that enables us to see bones inside the human body in hospitals. It's the technology that allows us to produce 3D pictures of objects and see inside them. But the basic process of X-ray imaging has these three principles. So we have an X-ray generator, where the X-rays come from. And that X-ray generator has a spot size, so the tiny emission area, and you can quantify that. It has an X-ray energy, and that can be tuned up or it can be tuned down, depending on where you get your X-rays from. And it has an X-ray brightness, so how many X-rays are coming out per second, how bright is the flash of X-rays. All those three principles help to describe how good your X-ray image will be. So your X-ray spot size is to do with image resolution. So how sharp, how much clarity do you get in your image? The smaller the spot size, 
the finer the features that you'll see, the smaller the features. The X-ray energy tells you what type of object you can see through. So the higher the X-ray energy, the larger the object or the more dense the, the material that you can see through. And then the X-ray brightness tends to tell you how quickly you can take your X-ray photograph. The more X-rays, of course, the better the X-ray and the faster you'll get your image. Now, in the X-ray technology world, if you were to pick up a catalogue of X-ray sources, of all the ones in the world, you'll get some that are really good at maybe two out of three of these things. So you can get some X-rays that have micro dots and they have variable energy, but their X-ray brightness is quite low. And vice versa, you can also get X-rays that are very high energy, but they come for a very large spot, and they're very bright. So sometimes you can get two, maybe one of those things out of the three. With an X-ray that comes from a laser accelerator, you hit all three of those at the same time. The X-rays come from a micro dot that is a few times the size of the laser spot size, so tens of microns in size. The X-ray energy is really easily controlled by how much laser energy we put in, even the angle of the laser interaction, the type of material that we shoot, it's very controllable. And the X-ray brightness is really high. So that's really good. And so for, for a while, we've been applying that and saying and building up a portfolio to demonstrate that these X-rays are really good. And one of the reasons why you'd want, you know, why would you want to even improve X-ray technology? And it's because it's a really large sector. Non-destructive testing is a, an umbrella term for testing a product, testing its quality, and assuring its quality in its lifetime before it goes out into the market. The non-destructive inspection market is about $13 billion global market each year. It's a huge market. And 30% of that is X-ray imaging radiography. These are the big players that tend to use X-ray radiography. And as you can see for some of them, you'll see why it's very important that we have very high quality X-rays that can do quality assurance very quickly. The nuclear industry, the aerospace industry, every part that goes onto a jet engine before it makes it into flight is tested rigorously to make sure that the lifetime is secured and that every part is top. And uh, I'm quite happy about that, <laughs> the amount of flights I have to take a year. Um, but there are new sectors emerging, like additive manufacturing, 3D printing of objects. We can make really intricate, exquisite internal designs to make things stronger and better, but how can you guarantee and validate that the design you put into your 3D printer is the one that you got out? How do you see inside it without breaking it open? You can use X-ray radiography. Carbon fiber composite materials, again, a new area of material science that opens up a lot of opportunity, but it has very fine internal structure that you need to guarantee. And the energy industry, really big growing burgeoning area where we want to increase the ability to store energy density and be able to tra transport it. All of these sectors require awesome X-rays and uh, we're starting to show that we have them. One of the projects I've been running for the last two and a half years now is the Platinum Project. That's pulsed laser accelerators for the inspection of nuclear materials. On the left-hand side is a little description of what we, we talk about here. So laser comes in, shoots onto a target, and then generates a burst of X-rays and particles called neutrons. Those X-rays are so high energy that they can see through nuclear waste barrels. And so we're now determining whether these X-rays are good enough quality to do 3D imaging of nuclear waste containers so that we can ensure that the legacy waste that is generated during nuclear power is stored correctly, that is stored safely, and that we have a full inventory of what's inside. Because these things have to be stored for possibly thousands of years, so we really need to get that right. And one of the hazards associated with nuclear waste storage is corrosion. 
where you get hydrogen or water that's seeped inside the barrels and is starting to eat away the uranium and the metals and cause corrosion growth that grows as fluffy clouds and can cause expansion. And when you have corrosion growing on the layer of metals, the corrosion uh, causes expansion, and that expansion can cause cracking and damage. So we did a little demonstrator where we took some pieces of natural uranium, we encased them in grout, which is special cement, and we deliberately corroded them, so the surface became fluffy with corrosion. And what we observed when we X-ray imaged them with our laser-accelerated X-rays and X-rays that come from a conventional uh, computer tomography uh, machine, we could see, visualize, the cracks that were coming from that corrosion growth. That was a key demonstrator to show that our X-rays had a high enough quality to see these micro-cracks through very dense material. So that was really exciting. Our next demonstrator was to say, well, we've looked at little things, and micro-cracks, let's look at large things, because that's the real challenge, actually, with X-ray imaging. So we placed a steel barrel, filled it with grout, which is kind of like concrete, and then placed a natural uranium penny behind it. So we kind of hid the uranium behind it. And then we generated our X-rays. The X-rays came through, through the uranium, through the steel, through the concrete, and landed on our X-ray camera, which is the image that you can see on the right-hand side. So that dark shadow in the middle is the uranium, and you're seeing it even behind this block of concrete, which is a key demonstrator that shows that our X-rays are high enough energy. And so we now know, we, you know we're kind of there. We've got some good enough um, images. But as you saw that last image, that wasn't the best X-ray image I've seen in my life. Um, it's a good first attempt, but I know we can do better. And a couple of the other ways that we've been trying to improve that is by specializing the targets that we shoot. So we normally shoot little square foils. But instead, we shot a wire one day. And that's on the left-hand side is a kind of diagram of that. So you're looking down the length of the wire, and that's what we shoot with the laser. Those two images side by side are knife-edge images. They help us quantify how sharp the image will be when we, when we get an image with these X-rays. And on the right-hand side is what happens when you shoot a normal foil, square foil. And on, on your right-hand side is what happens when you shoot a wire. So this, the image has become very sharp now. We also notice counterintuitively that we also get a sharp image when we widen the laser pulse. So if we shoot with a wider, fatter laser pulse, the X-ray images become sharper, which to me didn't make sense at first, because with a wider laser spot, I thought the X-ray spot would be larger. Therefore, I thought that the X-ray image would be more blurry. But it wasn't. In fact, that's part of the work that my PhD student um, published earlier this year and explained some of the physics behind why that wasn't the case. So our portfolio is growing. We've imaged through seven centimeters of steel. If anyone's ever held a big chunk of steel like that, you'll know how dense that material is. That is a really chunky piece of um, metal. But in one single flash of our laser X-rays, we can see through that steel. We can also see through nickel, which is another very dense material. We can see through tungsten, some of the most densest metals out there. We can very easily see through these things. And we can also see through very fine metals and structures, like carbon fiber composites and titanium. Now, the reason I've collected all of these materials together is that all of these materials you find in jet engines. There are parts of jet engines that are made up of super light composite materials, and there are parts in there that need to withstand extreme thermal loads, which means you need very high-density metals that can withstand those extreme conditions. So one of my driving questions in my research and innovation at the moment is, can we use a laser accelerator to see through a jet engine? And not only just see through an engine, but see it while it's rotating at full speed. Because these pulses of X-rays are so short in time, 
that they act like an extremely short shutter speed on a camera and can freeze frame even the fastest moving things, even the blades of a jet engine. Now, going back to my diagram, a physics diagram, I just told you all about X-rays, but there are some other things that come from laser accelerators, and that's high-energy particles. And one of the particles that comes out is a beam of protons and ions, heavy particles that are fully ionized atoms. Now, protons, in fact, it's 100 years yesterday that they discovered the proton for the first time. So it's, we're here on the 100th birthday of the proton, and that's what I spent my three and a half years of my PhD studying, was laser accelerated beams of protons. And one of the guiding reasons for doing that was applying it in future for particle beam cancer therapy. So particle beam cancer therapy has been around for decades. There are less than 100 of these centers all around the world, um, but they're very good at, doing, at treating cancers inside the body. This is what you would see if you were a patient in, for one of these centers. And this is what's happening when you go for particle theory. So this is what happens with X-ray radiotherapy. That's commonly when we call radiotherapy. The X-rays bombard through the body and come through the harmful tumor and uh, deposit harmful radiation to the cancer cells. But with a particle beam, the harmful radiation comes through the body and deposits on the cancer cell, but goes no further. In fact, the cells around the tumor will receive very little radiation dose compared to where the radiation tumor is. And that's because X-rays travel very differently through the body compared to particles. As particles slow down, they start to crash into things and can damage things just by crashing into them. So if you can control where that proton slows down, if you can make it so it slows down inside the cancer cells, it will de deposit collisional damage to the cancer cell, break apart the DNA strands, and kill off the cells. It's a much more effective way at treating cancers than using x-rays which when I first heard about this 10 and a half years ago, I said, why is that not in every hospital? Because that sounds excellent, much better than we have now. It's much better for treating uh, children and young people because you end up with a lot less damage to the healthy tissue. And one of the answers is that be the technology behind these centers is so huge and so costly. So inside that circle, it's highlighted, and, and inside again, that's where the patient sits. So this huge technology sits behind the wall, and that little round bit on the left-hand side is where the accelerator starts, and the rest of it is the beam transport, the kind of proton beam train that takes the beam and deposits it to the patient. So it's a lot of big uh, technology that costs a lot of money to install. And so when we first realized that lasers could also act as particle accelerators, and that the particle accelerator could be micro and supercharged, people start thinking, well, wait a minute. If you could do that, could you build a laser-driven proton beam therapy center? Would it make it cheaper? Would it make it more amenable for a hospital environment? And there's now even a question whether it could be even better than conventional technology can offer. And that's because laser accelerators offer a cocktail of particles. You can get a proton beam, you can also get a helium beam, a carbon beam, an iron beam. You can get all different types of iron species from the same laser accelerator. And that's one of the fundamental limits that conventional technology just simply cannot do. So there's a lot of work going on. This is just at the beginning of the research. There are radiobiologists asking, if you have a laser accelerator, what difference will that make to the radiobiology? One of the differences that we know already, we're not quite sure what the radiobiology will mean, but in terms of physics, a laser accelerator delivers a very ultra-high dose rate. The number here, 10 to the power of 9, is a billion. So it delivers a billion grays per second. Now, that's not a billion grays in total. 
because the pulse is very short. So an average number divided by a very short time frame gives you that huge number. That's why it's dose rate and not dose accumulated. But the dose rate of a laser accelerator is 10 to the power of 9, 1 billion gray per second. The dose rate of a regular conventional accelerator is only a few grays per second. So the dose rate of laser accelerators is very, very high. And we are not quite sure what happens. Does it make no difference? Is it worse? Is it better? We're only at the start of this radiobiology research now, applying these extreme um, laser plasma accelerators for this. And another question arises, which is, what is the radiobiological effectiveness of using multiple types of ions to treat the cancers? If you can bombard it with a proton, then a carbon, then a helium, you know, anything that you want in all the different combinations, a gold ion, if you fancy that as well, trying that out, what happens if you do proton, then carbon, or then carbon, then proton? Radiobiologists have never really asked that before because they never thought the technology was available to them. But we're standing here as a community of laser plasma accelerators and saying, look, we think we've got a machine that could revolutionize the way that you think about radiobiology. And so we're literally just now starting to ask that question. And I have uh, a radiobiologist coming to see me at the lab on Monday to talk exactly about this, about how we could put our minds together. She does lots of radiobiology. I know the physics stuff. So we're going to come together and see if we can figure it out together. Figuring things out together is another key message that I'd like to leave you on now as I wrap up, is that science and exploration is rarely a lone endeavor. Lots of people in science are needed with lots of different skill sets. This is just some, a snapshot of the team that I worked with uh, at the Vulcan Laser at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory last year. So what you're looking at here, this is our target area. This is where the lasers come in. This is where they fire into a vacuum chamber, and we generate these extreme high-temperature plasmas. But behind all of that is a team of people with ideas and passion and interest to bring all those ideas to life. Um, it requires diversity of ideas and experience, of cultures, of understanding, of disciplines. You need lots of people that can operate a laser. I don't know how to operate a laser, really. I know the basic fundamentals of how a laser works. What I do know is what happens when you press fire on one of those powerful lasers in the world. But I couldn't build one from scratch. That's why you need a team around you. And similarly, I'm an experimentalist, so I can design an experiment, I can understand the measurements, but I can't write an algorithm or a simulation code that includes all the equations. That, would, that requires a computational theoretical physicist, and so we have computational uh, people in our group as well. So the message here is that it requires kind of a diverse group of people coming together, applying their creativity and imagination um, in this group in particular, trying to save the world with lasers. Um, and with that, I will wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention and listening today.